cared about is how to live by that by that premise, how to put into practice what that premise means to us. And that's exactly what we are going to be doing here today. Now, so we do understand that Jesus is our shepherd, and now uh, that uh, those promises that are involved uh, in Psalms 23 are made to someone. So then to whom are these promises made? These promises are, of course, for those who make the Lord their shepherd. You know, uh, we do understand that the Lord is the shepherd, but we there is it's a, it's a different story if we accept the fact that He is my shepherd. He's not only the shepherd; it is mine. And uh, if we do um, accept that premise, there are six beautiful promises that Psalm 23 is able to present to us. Now, we uh, as Adventists, we are familiar with the story of the tabernacle uh, on the wilderness. Okay? Uh, but if we are not familiar or too familiar with that, uh, I want to, through the message today, we are we are going to have some sort of a, a refresher, okay, uh, on the topic of the sanctuary. And you probably will wonder, well, what does that have to do with Psalms 23, okay? So this is what uh, the tabernacle in the wilderness a long time ago, okay, has to do with Psalm 23 because. The tabernacle of the Old Testament illustrates the promises found in Psalm 23. You want to see that? We're going to take a look. The tabernacle had six pieces of furniture. And if you do not remember all those details, let me show you. Do we have a pointer here, Alberto? No? no? Okay, that's fine. So then if you uh, look from our right to the left, we can see the altar of the sacrifice, that was the first uh, piece of furniture as you are entering the sanctuary. The second one is the labor. To the top right, we can see the table of the showbread. And then on the uh, bottom, uh, uh, we can see the seven lamps or the candlestick. Okay, right in the middle of what it, of what it was called the holy place is the altar of the incense and the other room as, as uh, they entered, uh, it was considered the most holy place. And it has the mercy seat, in, uh, or also the Ark of the Covenant. And on top of that was the mercy seat. And inside the Ark of the Covenant, it was found, among others, the, uh, the tables of the commandments. Okay? So those are the six pieces of furniture. All right? So we did say that uh, these promises on the uh, Psalm 23 are actually uh, very related to what the message of the tabernacle is. And this is how we're going to see it. Okay? Each furniture of the tabernacle illustrates a promise revealed in Psalm 23. And it teaches us how we can use them for the glory of God. Each piece of furnishing uh, is a representation of one promise made in Psalm 23. The Psalm of the Good Shepherd holds six promises in six verses. Okay? You see six pieces of furnishing, six promises, and how many verses are found in Psalms 23? Six. six. Interesting, isn't it? Okay, let's go through all them. Okay, the first one, okay, is the first furniture. The altar of sacrifice represented the Lord's sacrifice on the cross. As soon as the um, uh, priest uh, entered uh, the, the atrium, okay, that was the first furnishing they found. Okay, and uh, in that altar of sacrifice, among others, Okay, they were uh, a representation of the gospel of Christ. 
And the first promise, according to Psalms 23, is found in the first verse. Psalm 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. Now, we do know that this altar represented the Lord's sacrifice on the cross. Okay? And if we accepted Jesus, if we accept Jesus, and if we accept his sacrifice, what is the first promise for those of us who do that? We will lack nothing. And when it says nothing, it means nothing. And think about it for a minute, brothers and sisters. Okay? If we make of the Lord our shepherd, the promise is we will lack nothing. That's a fantastic promise, isn't it? It is. Okay? Are we hungry? We will lack nothing. Are we thirsty? We will lack nothing. And just as our brother was presenting that testimony from his brother uh, there in Nigeria, okay? If we are in prison, we will lack nothing. If we are in financial difficulties, we will lack nothing. If we are having, we are struggling in school. So this is a um, educational environment here in prison. We will lack nothing. If we are having difficulties with our children, we will lack nothing. If we are having difficulties with our um, wife and with our husband, dear brethren, we will lack nothing. That's a fantastic promise, don't you think? Say amen if you do. Amen. amen. But what are we invited to do if we want this promise to be ours? We are to make of the Lord our shepherd. Now, through whom does the Bible say all is possible to us? This is a beautiful Bible verse. It's actually my wife's favorite. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Through Christ, we are able to have access to everything. And that's why the promise from Psalm 23 is a fact. We will lack none. And what did God give so that everything could be possible to, to the believer? Remember this beautiful verse? A favorite of many too? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Dear brothers, dear sisters, if we accept Jesus and his sacrifice as our personal sin, we will lack nothing. Yeah. Now, most of us probably have done that already. Most of us probably have accepted Jesus. And I was looking at the baptistry here. And most of us already have, have done that. But if there is someone here who have not accepted Jesus as their personal Savior, this is a good moment to reflect. This is a good moment to meditate. This is a good moment to make your mind up. This is a good moment to choose Jesus, the good shepherd, as your shepherd, so you are able to get access to this fantastic promise. You will lack nothing. The second furniture was the bronze layer, which represented the Lord's death, which cleanses us of all sins. Okay, and here we have the second promise, as found in Psalm 23, verse 2. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. You see in the relationship, see in the relationship, the labor, and now the second promise says, He leads me beside quiet waters. The pastors back in the day, they knew that in order, for, in order 
to feed their sheep. They were supposed to take them to a very quiet place. You uh, want to know that these sheep will not drink water from a, 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 a body of water that is too strong. They actually have to be very soft and very sweet kind of water. It cannot be uh, like a, like a, um, like the rafters when we go to the poppers, you know. No, no, no. Those are not places to have uh, the sheep drinking water. It has to be something that it was kind of quiet, okay? So, uh, and, and the pastors in those days, they, they knew that, and the Lord knows that. And brothers and sisters, we do need that. As the sheep of the Lord, we also are always willing to be uh, in peace, to live in peace. We do not want to get into trouble and to have any issues one with each other, okay? And the Lord knows that. And he makes everything in his power in order to help us to get there. And he is the one who helps us uh, do that. And if we make of Jesus our good shepherd, he actually promised that he will lead us into peaceful waters, to peaceful places as well. And on whom does our soul always lie down? You guys remember Psalm 91, verse one, verses 1 and 2? Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. Remember what did the Lord tell the Samaritan woman? When she went what? To pick up some water. Okay? Jesus said, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water that I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water that I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. And what did Jesus tell his disciples? Mark 16, 16. Whoever believes and is what? Baptized. Water. That's why we the attendant, we get baptized in water. It will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. My dear brothers and sisters, if we repent of our sins, we confess and repent, and we are baptized in the name of Jesus, the water of life, we will truly find rest. Of course, we want, we want to find um, rest. Well, we are to do something. We are to accept Jesus as our good shepherd and he will make sure that we have access to that eternal water of life. It was back in, I would say, 1973. So, and you guys um, are going to do the math, okay? So I was 12 years old, and I decided to get baptized. And it was, interestingly, on May 31st of 1973, I decided to give my life to the Lord Jesus, and I accepted him as my personal savior. He was 12 years old. Brothers and sisters, if there is someone here who has never accepted Jesus and has never been baptized, and we, when we get baptized, what we do is we get ourselves into a commitment, a serious commitment with the Lord. Okay? And if we do that, for us is the promise to get everlasting grace. And this beautiful promise is actually to those of us who do that. And if there is someone here who has not done that, the invitation is to you. Please, give your life to Jesus. Please, 
Get yourself into a serious commitment with him. Get baptized as he asks. And make sure that this promise is made, is, uh, is, is accepted by you and it will be received by you because you are accepting Jesus as your good shepherd. And that's number two. Let's go on to number, th uh, no, number th uh, three. The third furniture. The light of the lampstand represented the resurrection of Jesus, which opened the pathway of our salvation. Okay, and this is the light of the lampstand. Now, this is the third promise. That third promise is presented in the verse third of Psalm 23. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Oh, what a beautiful promise it is. He refreshes my soul and he guides me. How many times in life we actually um, think about, oh, I need some help here. I'm not sure what kind of decision I, I, I should make. I'm not sure uh, what pathway I should take. Okay? And we are all, all, all the time willing to get the opportunity to be guided by someone. But sometimes we do have that blessing and sometimes we don't. I remember last year, my wife and I made a trip to, to France and we wanted to, to, um, to, to go to the Eiffel Tower. And at the hotel they told us the best and the most effective way to do it is by you contracting with a guy, with a tour guide. Because that will take you through all these super, super long lines and it will take you straight to the place where you are going to go up. And it was a good thing that we accepted that advice. It cost us a little extra, okay? But as soon as we saw that beautiful, magnificent place, okay? But we saw those super, super long, long lines. And we said, oh, we made the best decision. Because it was good to be, or to have a tour guide who was taking us through the long lines and through the intricacies of the place and took us straight to the place where we got to, elevate, to the elevator and went all the way up to the top. It is good to have a good guide. Who provides courage in our difficult times and leads us to the right way? Who, who does that? Psalm 34, 7 and 8 says, The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. And he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. And how does the Lord guide us? How can he do that? Well, there is something we have to do. Psalms 119, 105 says, Your word is what? Is a lamp. Your word is a lamp. One of the things that I appreciated the most when I got my first iPhone was the fact that it has a light. I love it. I love it. I said, this is genius. I don't need to carry a lamp with me anymore. I don't have to have one in the car and one everywhere I go. Whenever I need it, as long as I carry my iPhone with me, I will have a light. It's so nice to have a light. And brothers and sisters, if we make of Jesus our shepherd, he will be a guide, he will be like a lamp to our pathways. That's the promise. It's found in uh, Psalms 119, 105. In the Word of God, we will find encouragement. In the Word of God, we will find light. In the Word of God, we will find guidance. Brothers and sisters, there is no, there is absolutely no way for us to become good Christians if we do not take time to read the Bible. Are you with me? There is absolutely no chance for us to become good Christians if we do not take time to read the Bible. And this 
should be a point in which we should meditate upon all that. We should reflect. And we should take a look back into our spiritual life and into our spiritual practices. How much do I make the body for every day? One minute, two minutes, five minutes, ten, half an hour, how much? And the more we do it, the better our spiritual life. Dear brothers, dear sisters, we need to read the Bible. It's the Word of God. And the Word of God is the lamp that will guide our thoughts. And the Word of God is the light that will guide our feelings. And the Word of God is the light that will guide our actions. And the Word of God is the light that will guide our habits. And the Word of God is the light that will guide our character. And the Word of God is the light that will guide our lives. But if we don't do it, then we're missing out. And just as the candlestick was placed in the holy place in order to illuminate, to provide light for the holy place, okay, the Word of God, it should be placed in our hearts in order to illuminate our thoughts, our feelings, our actions, our decisions, our habits, our lives. Number four. Are you with me? Okay. Fourth furniture. It is the altar of the incense, which represented the intercession of Jesus on our behalf. And in verse four is found the fourth promise. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. It's interesting that this promise is not telling us you're not going to walk on the valley. This, that's not the promise, okay? He says that he will walk with us through it. Beautiful promise. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. In my way here, I pass through some beautiful roads, beautiful scenery, that um, channel, I think, I think it's the canal road. Canal road, beautiful, beautiful. Okay? But one thing I noticed, I didn't see that many times. I never have done that, I, I never have taken that road before. Okay? But uh, I can only imagine during the evening. That must be those of you who might be familiar with that area. Okay? The canal road. Okay? Um, in the evening, that must be very dark. Alright? Very dark. And the interesting thing is, the Lord is always with me. When we are going to the darkness, to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the darkest valley, to the darkness in our lives, the Lord is always with us. Okay? So who is a refuge according to Psalm 46.1? Who is our strength? And who is it, uh, the ever-present help during our time of trouble? Who's that one? God. God is our refuge. God is our strength. And He is the ever-present help in trouble. And how do we become aware of God's presence within our lives? Matthew 26, 38, give us the answer. Do you have an idea what would the answer be? Okay. How do we become aware of God's presence within our lives? Here it is. Then the Lord says, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. What does that mean? Keep watch with me. Okay? That means pray. Prayers. Praying. How do our prayers reach God's presence? Okay? 
Revelation 8, 3 and 4 give us a glimpse. Another angel, which means Jesus, who had a golden censer, came and stood at the altar, and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all God's people on the golden altar in front of the throne. The smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of God's people, went up before God from the angel's hands. And, dear brothers, prayers are the ones who are going to help us to go through that valley of darkness. When we pray, Jesus intercedes on our behalf. So there is absolutely no reason to fear. I don't know how many of you are familiar with um, the late pastor, not an Adventist pastor, but um, um, trying to remember, Bob. Uh, ooh, shoo, shoo. Right. Uh, I forgot his last name, but if he comes to me, I will tell him. Okay? Um, he used to have this beautiful radio program entitled Walk with the King. So if anybody listened to it, no? All right. Bob Cook, thank you, sister. Yes, Pastor Bob Cook. Okay, walk with the king. What a beautiful uh, devotionals, what a beautiful meditations uh, this man of God um, had. And I think there is still some radio stations that uh, actually uh, present uh, the word uh, to him. And one of the, my favorite expressions that I loved from him was this one. Pray your way through the day. Pray your way through the day. And he used to say, pray when you open the door. Pray when you close the door. Play, uh, pray when you uh, answer the phone. You never know who's on the other side of the line. And he used to say, Pray when you open a letter. You never know if it's a bill or if it's a check. Interesting, isn't it? Pray your way through your day. And brothers, that's the message for us. Pray. If you look back today to your prayer life and you find that you actually do not pray that much, can you please become serious about improving your prayer life? Amen. Okay, because it will make a whole of a difference. Okay? Pray when you are in bed. Pray when you are out of bed. Pray when you are on you on the way to your work. Pray when you are in your work. Pray when you are in your house. Pray, of course, when you are in church. Pray when you are in the street. Pray when you are in the kitchen. Make pray become your lifestyle. You will see the difference. And Jesus will intercede on our behalf. There is absolutely no reason to fear. Take a look on that interesting, the very last line of that verse. The smoke of the incense together with the prayer of God's people went up before God from the angel's hand. And then let's take a look on the second one. The second line says, he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all God's people. This is what happened. When we pray, our prayers are not of good smell because we are sinners. So when our prayers get to him, Okay? The smell of that prayer of that prayers is not good. So what the incest does, and he is given, Jesus is the intercessor, and Jesus is given a lot. It says much incense in order to make our prayers of a better smell to be presented before the Father. So as soon as our prayers go up, so then the incense production machine begins working in heaven. Incense. And the Lord takes those prayers into his hands. And when he goes to the Father, he says, Father, 
This is not Caesar's prayer. These are not Mary's prayer. These are not Paula's prayer. These are not Joseph's pray prayers. These are not Ted's prayers. This is me. Don't look at them, O oh Father. Look at my hands. And when the Lord see that, those hands that have been pierced for us, he says, I accept those prayers. Let's get more of that. Let's get more of that. We Christians, we do not pray enough. You want to know what the average, what, how long the average Christian pray? How long? <coughs> per day. Yes, per day. How long does a Christian pray per day? Three minutes. Three minutes. Mercy, let's make it much, much better than that. If our prayer life is not good enough, from this point forward, in order for us to make of Jesus our good shepherd, let's make sure that we take more time to pray. Fifth furniture, and we have to rush, I guess, right? So the table of the children represented the suffering of Jesus on our behalf. Okay, it's the fifth furniture, and which is the fifth promise found in verse five of Psalm 23. It says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. I'm so happy, I'm so enthusiastic because this is a magnificent promise. This is a magnificent promise. There is, table, there is a table in front of us, and it is prepared for us, and my cup, my heart, my mind, my body is overflowing with happiness. What does it mean to have a prepared table? Then came the day of unlimited bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed, and Jesus sent Peter and John saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. What do you want us to prepare for it, they asked. What does that mean to have a prepared table? Well, very simple. To have a prepared table means to have food on it. How do we love a table which is empty and no food on it? We don't like that. But when we have the food and it has food on it, we're happy. And if it's abundant food, we are happy about it, okay? So, and who is the bread of life? Who is the food of life? Because bread, of course, is the representation of food, right? So, Jesus declared one, I am the bread of life, and whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. We are invited, brothers and sisters, to trust in Jesus, and if we do that, he will bring true happiness to our lives. This is very unfortunate to have or to declare yourself or to declare ourselves a Christian and we live in a very a life full of sadness. Okay? Oh, I have um, all kind of uh, illnesses. Oh, I have all kind of troubles. I have all kind of difficulties. I have all kind of problems. And my son, and my daughter, and my husband, and my work, and always complaining and complaining time after time after time. Brothers and sisters, if we want to be the light of the world, okay, we are to live by the light of the world. And that one is Jesus. We are to trust in Him all the time. Yes, I have a pain in my body. But I put it to, on the feet of Jesus, he will take care of that. Yes, I have issues at work, yes, I, but I brought it to the feet of Jesus, he will take care of them. Amen. Let's trust in Jesus. And there is another, uh, another pastor, is, uh, um, uh, another speaker that also talks in the reality, that's Pastor Charles Stanley. Okay, Pastor Charles Stanley, uh, in the morning he's picked up at 7 o'clock. So then he said, uh, uh, he says, pray to the Lord, bring 
your problems to Jesus and leave the consequences to him. When we bring our problems or difficulties to the Lord, just bring them to him. And I stood up just as the mother of Samuel did. Hannah, remember her? What did she do? She stood up and she went on and she was no longer sad. Let's trust in the Lord. If we look back, can we, how do we see ourselves in terms of trusting the Lord? Do we trust Him? Or we just ask Him, oh Lord, bless me here, bless me there, and then we stand up, move on, and continue worrying about it. That's not exactly what the Lord wants. He wants us to trust in Him. And we have one last piece of furniture. It's the sixth furniture, the Ark of the Covenant, which represented the presence of God amongst us. And then we have the sixth promise, which is found in Psalm 23, verse 6. And this one is superb. Surely your goodness and what? And mercy says in the versions, and this one says love will follow me all days of my life and he will dwell and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever forever okay can you imagine dwelling in the house of the Lord forever living in the house of the Lord forever okay uh, my I just became a grandpa a grandfather uh, three months ago and uh, my wife and I are very happy my son and his wife, they live in White Plains, New York. Okay, and the other day they were telling us that for um, work reasons, uh, so he, uh, they are accepting a transfer for his work from New York to Dallas. And then we say, oh Lord, so that means that we are, if we want to um, get to see our grandson, Growing up, we're going to have to travel a little a little longer, okay? Not just driving one hour and a half to White Plains, but taking a plane down to Dallas for a couple of hours, all right? But one of the reasons our son is telling us why we're moving is because it says the, the, uh, the salary here in New York, uh, taking the same salary down there to Texas, it will be better, okay? And they will be able to uh, obtain um, a bigger house that they can afford or they can actually find in New York. And I understand that, okay? And all of us understand that, correct? Interesting. The Lord is promising us that we, we make of our Lord, our Shepherd, we will dwell in His house. And dear brothers, His house is so big, it's so beautiful. Okay, I told you about that trip my wife and I took to, to France the, the last year. We went to the verse, uh, what is the pronunciation of that? Is uh, Versailles Palace? Versailles Palace, thank you. Whew. Oh, you've never been there. That's so beautiful. It's huge, huge. You have to walk miles to get to the end of the property. Miles. The garden is beautiful. And uh, the, the, the doors, the windows, the splendor, the paintings, the furniture, beautiful. And that's only an earthly king. The, the, the house of the Lord, it will be a thousand times better than that. And that's a promise for us if we do what? If we actually make of the Lord our shepherd. God loves us so much. Who demonstrated goodness and love on earth? Who did that? I am the Lord, he says, who exercise kindness and justice and righteousness on earth, for in these things I delight, declares the Lord. God demonstrated his love through justice and righteousness 
Love and faithfulness be together, righteousness and peace kiss each other. And who has God given judgment upon? Who's thou and his own? Whoever does not honor the Son, and that's Jesus, our shepherd, does not honor the Father who sent him. And what promises are given to those who honor the Lord? Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching because my Father will love them and I, and we will come to them and will make our home with them. If we are willing to make of the Lord our shepherd, we actually do not need to wait to experience the love of God in heaven. We are able to experience the word of God here on earth. The presence of the Lord brings the kind of love which will endure forever. If we experience, if we allow Jesus to be uh, the shepherd of our lives, our churches will be churches of love. Amen. Our houses will be houses of love. Our homes will be homes of love. Our work will be work of love. Our lives will be lives of love. And if we do that, we will, experience, we will begin to experience heaven in earth. Today, We've studied six promises taken from Psalm 23rd, and we have learned how to use them in our lives to honor God. And here you find them all. I shall not want. He leads me beside the still waters. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. You prepare a table before me. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all days of my life. And sister, why? Give us this beautiful promise. The soul that has given himself to Christ is more precious in his sons than the whole world. The Savior would have passed through the agony of Calvary that one, one, one might be saved in his kingdom. Who is that one? It could be you. It could be me. All these beautiful promises are made to you. If we do what? If we accept the Lord Jesus as our good shepherd. What shall we do for him then? What shall we do? Okay, we are to accept Jesus. If anybody here didn't accept Jesus yet, this is a good time to do so. We are to repent of all sins, of, of, of all sins, and get baptized. If there is anybody here who has never accepted Jesus before, and have not been baptized, this is a good time to do so. We need to read the Word of God more. We probably read it, maybe a couple minutes a day. Let's do it more. We need to pray without ceasing. How long will we pray? Let's pray more. Let's share Jesus. Let's trust in Him and let's share it with others through the testimony of our lives. And let's allow the love of the Lord be all the time, ever present in our lives so all the people are able to see Jesus in our lives, our good shepherd. Dear brothers and sisters, the Lord loves us so much and if we allow his love to be present in our lives, we are making him our good shepherd. And all those beautiful six promises, Psalm 23, presented to us today, will be ours. I know we're going to sing a song, but let me have a word of prayer before we do. Let's bow our heads. Today, your Father, we thank you for giving us Jesus, our good shepherd. Please allow Him every day in our lives to transform our characters from glory to glory, to transform our thoughts and our feelings. Please allow Him to guide us every day so we can exercise the power of our will to make time for You, to read the Bible, to pray, 
and worship in spirit and truth and to help others. Today we've learned we need to do that to fulfill your church's most important work, which is preaching your beautiful gospel, the love of our great Lord Jesus Christ. In his precious name, we ask you for this blessing. So, Father, Amen. Thank you so much for that message. Uh, please sing as, please stand as we sing, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, Psalm 23, to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus saith the Lord. Sing with me. Jesus, Jesus. 